Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Hi guys, welcome to Hope Church Red Velen's Sofa Sermon. Uh, my name is Ryan, I'm one of the leaders at Hope Church here. Um, and today I'm talking to you, as you know, from Mark chapter 12. Now the title of this is, Is the Church Half Dead? And it's looking at the greatest commandment that Jesus gave. So um, first I want to just say thanks to the worship team this week. That was that was great, wasn't it? Um, a little extra preparation there. All that hard work paid off, I'm sure. So um, as I said, my name's Ryan. I'm one of the leaders here. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm a husband to my wife, Sarah, who just read the passage for us. Um, I've been living in Wales for nearly nine years now, and I'm a maths teacher at a boarding college in South Wales. Uh, my wife and I are currently social distancing on campus, which we're really blessed uh, to, to be in the beauty of this, this campus. Uh, we love taking long walks along the coastal path and around uh, the woodlands nearby. So it's quite a provoking question, hopefully. Uh, is the church half dead? Why, why am I talking about that? Why would I say something like that? Well, um, 20 years ago now, uh, in, on the 16th of April in the year 2000, the Independent newspaper wrote an article um, and they made a famous prediction saying that the church will be dead in 40 years. So we're, we're halfway through that. And um, last week I, I read a blog post by Phil Moore on thinktheology.org and he was questioning, you know, are we half dead then? If the church will be dead in 40 years, are we halfway through this? Uh, and why is it significant um, that you know, 20 years through, we have this, this season of lockdown, this season of social distancing. This, he calls it a half-time season. Um, he, he writes that he thinks this is a time where we can reflect on the church's attitude to the word, um, the church's attitude to the person of the Holy Spirit, and on the gift of God's mercy and kind of experiencing it afresh in these times. So I'll ask again, is the church half dead? Well, there's been many times over the last, you know, 2000 or so years where uh, people and organisations have said, no, 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 Christianity is relevant, or it will decline, it will fade away and become nothing. Uh, all the way from the crucifixion, you know, the, when Jesus was uh, crucified, some of the Pharisees there were like, no, 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 this Jesus guy, it'll all just blow over, you know, there's been, there's been resurgences before, there's been uprisings before, it'll all amount to nothing. Um, and again, all the way up to that, that prediction in the year 2000 from the independent that will be only 40 years left. But every single time that these happen, um, obviously Christianity is still here, isn't it? These predictions um, are wrong. Christianity cannot be quelled. But that doesn't mean we have no responsibility to ensure the church's survival, to ensure the kingdom continues. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit on how do we not be half dead? How do we ensure that that prediction doesn't you know, come true? Um, how do we keep going? Well, the answer in short is that we follow God's commands. We follow Jesus's commands. So I'm bringing a short message today, hopefully, but, a sh and, but an important one, which is what is God's command? What is Jesus's command? Um, and we're in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. If you want to find this for yourself, uh, Sarah already read them for us. And in these verses, Jesus is being challenged by the religious leaders of the day. Um, these guys were always fed up with Jesus and they, they tried and succeeded to kill him. Um, 
they didn't like him because he he spoke with scripture from authority he um you know he, he spoke with authority we read uh we we know that jesus was in and amongst the people unlike the religious leaders who wouldn't really socialize with with some sorts of people some types of people some backgrounds and the religious leaders they didn't like him because he was bringing hope for all people not just people who are um already perfect and already living right as, as they thought they were but it is easy to forget that the the pharisees the scribes the religious leaders uh, they were supposed to be god's people and um well most of them ha um not all of them but well most of them had lost sight of god in following god's laws um they they were you know they honestly believed that lots of them honestly believed that they were following god's will um, if, again, if you think of Paul, um, before he, he became Paul the Apostle, he was Saul, and he was a Jewish leader, and he was following God's law in persecuting Christians and killing Christians. He honestly believed he was doing what was right and quelling this rebellion, this uprising from this bloke named Jesus and all of his followers, even though Jesus was dead. Um, and it's only when he encounters the risen Jesus that he realizes, oh no, this is truth. This is real, and, and his his life completely changes around. So, um, most of these guys, most of these religious leaders, but not all of them, had lost sight of God in following the laws. They're blindly following the letter. They're forgetting the heart of God, the heart behind the rules and laws of the Old Testament. They were they were proud that they were a superior people. They were better than these sinners around them. They refused to be with them. Hence, they didn't like Jesus because he, he came to be with all people. So in Mark 12, verses 28 to 34, we see one of these times where um, somebody's challenging Jesus um, during a dispute. And actually, I think that we, we can tell that this comes from a genuine question, that this comes from someone who actually wants to follow God's will. He wants God's heart behind these commandments. Um, so the highlights of, of what Sarah read for us is Jesus's response to what is the most important commandment? Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Um, you can see why this is one of the most important things that Jesus said. It is in answer to an important question. What does God ask us to do? What's the purpose to our lives? How do we find fulfilment in our lives? What's the most important thing God wants us to do? That's what the scribe is asking, isn't he? What's the most important thing God wants me to do so that I can follow him and and, um, and honour him and glorify God? How do we follow God's will with all of these laws and commands? What's the most important thing to do? Jesus says, God is one. You should love him and you should love one another. And in agreement, the, scribes, the scribe kind of goes, yeah, great. That's what I believe too. That's, that's far more important than all of the other individual laws and all the sacrifices and offerings that I could do. That's how I read the Old Testament as well, that God is a God of love and we should love him and love our neighbours. So if all of the commands of God can be summarised by these verses, that's the way the church is going to continue to avoid being half dead or continue to quell these predictions. That's why we are still going, um, despite persecution, despite all these um, people saying that we're irrelevant, um, the reason we're still going is because we're able to follow God's commands. Each time um, a revival happens, it's because people seek God and they come to know God and love God. And out of that, they can love one another and love their neighbours. And this is what God is commanding us to do today and always. So what does this look like? Well, Jesus says we should love um, God fourfold. So I'm going to break it down into those four parts. And he also says we should love our neighbour. I'm going to try and leave that for another time. That's a whole other sermon in itself. Um, but Jesus says we should love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. And no surprise is that this, as well as loving our neighbour, is reflected through many parts of the Old and New Testament. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at each of them now. <clears throat> First of all, then, loving God with all your heart. God wants us to love him. Um, because a relationship without the heart is nothing. So if I ask you a quick question, what do you love doing? Or maybe a better question, if I was to ask your friend or your neighbour, what do you love doing? What would they say? 
Well, if you asked that about me, I'd hope that people would know three things about me. One, that I love Sarah. Um, I'm lucky enough to be spending time with her 24-7 at the moment. Maybe she's not so lucky. Um, but I talk about her all the time. Um, my reactions to certain things take her into account. I, I'll put her first and I'll show her off because I love her. Secondly, I, I love maths and I love teaching. Again, I'm lucky enough to have a job uh, uh, teaching the school subject that I find most interesting, most most stimulating, most important in my opinion. I know that's a, that's a, a varied opinion, but still. And I enjoy seeing maths in nature. I enjoy learning new things. You know, I watch YouTube videos about maths. Um, it's everywhere and it's inescapable. And Galileo Galilei famously said that mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. And I wholeheartedly agree. It's everywhere. But thirdly, of course, uh, people will know about me that I love God because I talk about God all the time. I talk about my uh, the Bible. I talk about my faith a lot. And um, my reactions also take my faith into account when I'm deciding things. Well, I'll put my faith first and I'll show off the promises and the hopes that I have in, in God and in the Bible. Um, and I get to teach the most interesting, the most stimulating and the most important subject at church as well. Um, and I enjoy seeing God in nature. I enjoy learning new things. I, I read books about God. He's everywhere and inescapable, just like Max. So Jesus says that we are to love God with all our heart. But too often we can put something else there, can we? We can end up chasing a career or chasing money or chasing pleasures and the things of this world. Or just maybe we spend too much time doing something else, like giving too much of our time to Netflix or something, especially in lockdown. Um, whilst these things aren't necessarily bad in themselves, it's when they, when they replace God, when they uh, take up too much of our time that they become a problem, don't they? And I remember one of the most helpful things, um, one of the most helpful ways I remember being taught to put God first uh, when I was at a Christian camp called New Day, some of you might have heard of. Um, I remember hearing uh, that you should just imagine a throne in your head. Imagine a glorious, magnificent, golden royal throne, the, the most amazing throne you can. And then um, put whatever's taking up your time on it. Picture a TV on it. And how stupid does that look? Or picture just a, a normal person or your crush on it. And, you know, how stupid does that look? You can't worship that. Um, a TV can never give anything back to you. Or just, you know, another person will they'll always fail you eventually. But God on the throne, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the universe, your heavenly father, that makes sense to have on that throne. That makes sense to worship it. So Jesus says we are to love God with all our hearts, also because God loves us with his heart. Um, scripture says in many places about God's love for us. One of the most famous being John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, they wouldn't be lost, but they'll have eternal life. They can be found in him. I'll think of the prodigal son, where the, the father loves his son and he's looking for him to return. So... First of all, then, we should love God with all our heart because people see our hearts and because the things that we love are what we spend time doing and talking about. God wants us to put that time into a relationship with him too. He has a heart for you. Secondly, uh, all of our soul, God wants us to know him. Uh, a relationship which we're not partaking in is nothing. So maybe this is a little bit more difficult to explain, so bear with me, but... Your soul is like your essence, it is yourself, it is very you. Um, it's the part of you that is eternal, whether you believe it or not. Um, and it's the part that distinguishes you from everything else, isn't it? From everybody else. Uh, even if you're a, a identical twin, you're genetically identical to somebody else. You're different selves, you're different persons, because your soul is what separates you. Um, Psalm 139 says, You have searched me, Lord, and you, you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. So God truly knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself, certainly. Um, and better yet, he chose you as you are to be his. He's chosen you as you are now to be his and to get to know him as well. Jesus says we're to love God with all our soul. But too often we barely let God a glimpse at ourselves, don't we? If we're to love God with all ourselves, we need to learn to bear them, to open up, 
to show ourselves to God, to show all of ourselves to God. And I think this is done best in prayer. The Bible is a, tre is a, is a treasure trove of prayers. If you're not sure how to pray, then you know, ask some people to help you or, or just take a look in scripture. Uh, the Psalms, there's, there's a book in the Bible called the Psalms. They're, they are songs and prayers to God and they vary massively. Um, there's, if you don't believe me, check out for a moment, check out Psalm 23 or Psalm 103. Those are quite famous kind of positive Psalms where the, the writer, usually David, is um, he's happy and he's, he's able to pray and praise. Um, but compare those to Psalm 69. Uh, if you're ever struggling with what to say or you're just in a, a horrendous circumstance, Psalm 69 is a prayer of great pain. Uh, read that and and just see that God wants us to be honest to him. You know, this is this is scripture and, and David is basically saying, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Why, you know, my life is terrible. Help me. Um, the Old Testament in general has many prayers from from different people, people like Deborah or Hannah. Uh, to the patriarchs like Moses and Abraham. Um, we've got the New Testament and the Gospels as well and, and different prayers and, and sermons in those. Um, if you if you want to know the best way to pray, then study what Jesus says in prayer. Um, the disciples who didn't know how to pray, they asked Jesus. And, you know, we can ask Jesus how to pray as well. Um, but if we, if we look at what Jesus did, he frequently withdrew um, to be by himself or with just a few people for for fairly long periods of time longer than we would pray for probably um just to be with his heavenly father and to know his will he he says elsewhere in in john that he does nothing without knowing the father's will first so if you don't believe me that we need to bear our souls in prayer just read a little bit more carefully uh, the account of jesus in the garden of gethsemane and and hear the real the pain that jesus is experiencing hear the um the, the bareness of his soul, if you like. Uh, elsewhere, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for the Lord's people, for all of the Lord's people. Now, the American author, I think he's American, R.A. Torrey, um, an associate of D.L. Moody, if you've heard of him, has a wonderfully short but very helpful book I've read recently called How to Pray. Um, it's very self-explanatory, but it's really, really good. And it's quite short. It's easy to wrap your head around. It was free on Kindle. So How to Pray, R.A. Tori, download it. Um, and in it, he, he comments on that verse um, in Ephesians, which says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. He says... Uh, when we stop to weigh the meaning of these words, the intelligent child of God is driven to say, I must pray, pray, pray. Whatever else I do, I must pray. And he gives 10 fun reasons for why we should pray. Um, you know, he writes a, a bit on each of these, but I just wanted to read them because I think they're, they're good. Uh, first of all, there's a devil because we have opposition, so we should pray against that opposition. Uh, secondly, prayer is God's appointed way for obtaining things. We are told to pray to our Father in heaven who will give us gifts. Thirdly, the apostles regarded prayer as the most important business of their lives. Uh, we read about how um, they, they uh, nominated people um, to, to help the church so that they could focus on spending more time in study of the word and of Jesus and of prayer because they, they figured that was really important. Uh, prayer played a very important part in the earthly life of our Lord. Again, Jesus prays a lot in Scripture. And fifth, this is a this is a new one for me. This is really good. Praying is the most important part of the present ministry of our risen Lord. Jesus is praying for us right now. Um, in Hebrews seven verse twenty five, it, it says that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. And in Romans eight thirty four, it says Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is praying for us now and we read also in scripture that the Holy Spirit uh, he guides us in prayer as well when we don't know what to pray he, he groans for us he he prays for us as well. Number six prayer is the means that God has appointed for our receiving mercy and grace in times of need for fresh understanding prayer is how we get it. Uh, prayer in the name of Jesus is the way Jesus appointed his disciples to obtain fullness of joy that's how they were to 
to experience him is to, to pray in Jesus' name. Uh, prayer in all seasons is the means that God has appointed for our obtaining freedom from anxiety and peace of God, which passes all understanding. Um, knowing God and, and being with God is how we get free from those worries and things and how we can get peace. And ninth prayer is the means that Christ has appointed for us to fix our eyes on him when we're lost, when we don't know what to do. Um, if we if we look up and if we pray, then that's when we can get that fresh perspective, isn't it? And number 10, because prayer works, it does loads of things. Somehow, part of the mystery of the gospel is that uh, God wants us to pray. He wants us to, to communicate with him, even though he knows what's going to happen and his plan doesn't change. God doesn't change when we pray. Um, he he knows he wants us to be involved in in the world. He wants us to pray. Um, he he makes things different when we pray, knowing in advance that he would make them different when we will pray. So it's well worth a read. Jesus says that we have to love God with all our soul because he has modelled it. And essentially he's teaching us that prayer is relational. It's not transactional. Uh, prayer like the Bible, prayer like God wants, prayer like Jesus asks, is not, oh, Father, let me find a parking space. But it's a constant and a meaningful relational conversation with the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Apparently, Tori also famously said that one night of prayer will save us from many nights of insomnia. So if you've got something which is keeping you up, then um, stay up and spend one whole night praying about it. And then you'll sleep well the rest of the week because you've given it to God. You won't worry anymore. So love the Lord your God with all your soul because God sees your soul because he knows you, he formed you, he cares for you and God wants you to get to know him in a prayerful relationship with you too. But thirdly, Jesus says that we have to love God with all our mind um, because God wants us to comprehend him somehow. Um, a relationship that you're not thinking in is nothing. Um, now I say that God uh, and Jesus want us to comprehend God with Aristotle's phrase, the more you know, the more you realise you don't know in mind. Uh, we cannot ever comprehend God. Uh, we cannot ever know everything about him. Uh, God is vast and high. Uh, scripture tells us this as well. In Isaiah 55, um, verses 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And in Psalm 139, Jesus said, um, it says, Such knowledge is too wonderful to me attain, too lofty for me to attain. Uh, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Now, it's said that you can become a master of anything if you spend 10,000 hours doing it. I.e. it takes 10,000 hours practice to master the piano or to, to master playing tennis. Uh, Sarah and I have started playing tennis we're terrible at it. It's going to take us way, way longer than 10,000 hours. Um, or maybe if you want to become a master of the literary works of Shakespeare, then you need to spend 10,000 hours studying him. Now, I can't help it, but do some maths. Um, 10,000 hours is 417 days non-stop, 24-7. Obviously impossible. So let's say you go, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become the master of this thing. Um, and you're going to do something as a career. You're going to spend six hours every day seven days a week, then that's more than four and a half years. Uh, so if you want to be the next Djokovic or Andrew Murray, then you need to commit to five hours every day, six hours a day, and then you might be as good as them. But don't forget, they've already had a large head start on you. Now, I say this because even though you cannot become a master of God, you know, we cannot comprehend him. Even if we did this, even if we spent, you know, the next five years, six hours every single day, um, we just, we realise more and more what Aristotle said, that the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. Um, I, I see this when um, I'm studying mathematics or in the sciences, that the more you study, the more you see, the more you understand, the more you begin to perceive just how unthinkably complicated the world is, the universe is. Um, and it's made even more marvellous and, and glorious when you read that. Um, Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power in Hebrews and in Colossians we read for in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible with their thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things and in him all things hold together 
So when Jesus says that we're to love God with all our minds, he doesn't mean that uh, you should become a monk for five years after becoming a Christian, uh, study God, study his words, you know, pray in the spirit. And then when you've spent 10,000 hours and you've mastered uh, like 1% or a millionth of a percent of, of, of God, once you've spent that 10,000 hours, then you can have a relationship with God because you'll understand who you're having a relationship with. No, um, he says that we can have a relationship with God immediately. As long as we believe in him, we can have a relationship with God. But Jesus does mean that it takes effort, uh, that that God is worth knowing about, he's worth pursuing, he's worth studying and learning. It's worth trying to understand more of who God is and his character. And this is where the Bible is invaluable. Um, we, we need to spend way more time than we do studying the word and reading the word. Um, there's no substitute for it, there isn't. Uh, Christian books and commentaries are really helpful, they're genuinely amazing. Um, I've learned things from Christian books that you know maybe you don't learn from the Bible. Um, it's it, I forget who, but somebody has said that um, the Bible is not the only thing you need to read because you know the Bible doesn't teach you how to talk. Or well, there's there's lots of things which are good which are not in the Bible, but everything in the Bible is good. So everything in there is profitable for um, for teaching. It says in the Bible as well. Um, so there's no substitute for reading just the word. Christian books and commentaries are helpful and also listening to preachers are really really helpful. That's an amazing tool, you know, you're doing that right now. You're listening to a preach, that's really really good. But reading and meditating upon the word yourself too is amazing and, and there's no substitute for it. So, theology uh, exists because we have been given brains to think and create and explore and discover and Jesus wants us to use them to reveal the glory of God. So Jesus says that we have to love God with all our mind because God is vast. He's beyond comprehension, but he wants us to try and understand him. He wants us to know of him and to know his character. He wants us to use our heads in relationship with him. The more you know, the more you realise you don't know. That phrase becomes, the more you know about God, the more you realise how awesome he is, how amazing, how glorious, how marvellous, how worthy, how magnificent, how worthy of worship he is. Um, there we go. And then finally... Uh, Jesus says that we are to love God with all of our strength. And this, this is because we have to fight for him. Um, a relationship which you're not fighting for is nothing. The New Testament is very clear that we have a fight ahead of us. It can be a real struggle at times to live for God. And we are promised persecution. We are promised um, opposition. Uh, the, the world, the flesh and the devil are, are our famous adversary. The devil being the orchestrator of everything against us. Um, but not the one with the final say. Uh, the world that which traps us by keeping us busy, by throwing things in our path, um, by increasing the speed of our lives so we don't have time for good things. It's cares and it's snares for profit, for self, for survival of the fittest, for climbing endless ladders of supposed security. Um, it can be a real fight to build a house on the rock of God sometimes, can't it? And not to pursue these things for themselves, but actually to ask God what he has in store for us. And to pursue the things that God has for us. And to keep following that narrow path. And the flesh, of course, traps us into self-love. It distorts our natural desires, things that God has given us, into overwhelming wants. Making us appalling creatures of habit, the phrase is, isn't it? Um, and it is a fight to live according to the spirit in us, as opposed to the flesh in us. Now, I don't know what your temptations are. Um, it might be you're tempted to gossip or, or bring judgment. Maybe it's food or drink or pornography or gambling or anxiety or anger or fear or self-depreciation. Uh, we can be tempted to do all, all or, or some of those things. And it's a real struggle to fight them, isn't it? But the greatest lie that the devil tells you is that you can't do it, you can't fight and that you're alone. But you're not alone. God is rooting for you. We've just seen how Jesus is interceding for us. The spirit works in us. You're not alone. Um, you've got each other as well. I'm sure that staying at home and self-isolation are wreaking havoc across the globe. Um, sadly, we already know that domestic abuse and child abuse are increasing. We know that mental health is decreasing. Um, you know, temptations and, and things like that are going to be rife, aren't they? But um, you're not alone. We, we have the strength of God to fight for us. We can take action 
Um, in the name of Jesus, we can take action today, whether it's simple things like installing a website blocker or deciding and tracking that you're going to do good habits or putting things in the way of bad habits um, or whether it's getting accountable to a mate. I highly recommend you, you know, grab someone, you know, preferably of the same gender, grab someone you trust, start a WhatsApp group and just tell them that you need their help. Be as honest as you can or as honest as you like. Uh, you might, you know, you might want to tell them exactly what's going on. You might not. It's it's up to how much you can. But, um, you know, you might simply um, think of them when when you're being tempted or when you're in need and say, hey, Mr. X, I'm really tempted right now. Um, I'm really tempted to lash out in anger or something. Can you pray for me? Or, or maybe you'll be slightly more vague and you'll just say, hey, you know, Mrs. Y, I'm really in need of a distracting phone call right now. Are you busy? Can you help me? Um, get around each other, you know, pray for each other, be with each other, just share Bible verses with one another so that you have a place to look when you're in need. Um, but the Bible amazingly says that God does not let us be tempted more than we can bear, but he, he provides a way out, he provides a way of escape, the Bible says. And on persecution and imprisonment, when we've got um, uh, maybe more of an external fight to, to have in turn of, instead of an internal fight against persecution and imprisonment, the Bible says that we don't have to worry um, about what to say in our defence because the Spirit will give us the words to speak. Um, it says that we should be ready to share the reason for the hope that we have. Um, and on strength, it says loads of things. It says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might stand. And I'm going to read the whole of Psalm 121 because it's only eight verses. Um, this is a great one for, for getting strength from. He says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel, over God's people, will never slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. So Jesus says that we are to love God with all our strength, because loving and living for God can be a fight. And he knows that. And God wants you to fight for him, but better yet, he gives us the strength to fight for him as well. He gives us the very things we need to fight. So Jesus says we are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. That's what we're called to do. But I haven't even touched on the second, Jesus says, the second most important is to love your neighbour as yourself. Um, that's a whole other sermon, but it's it's equally important, maybe more important in some ways, um, because whereas God, only God can really tell how much you love him, the world can tell how you love your neighbour. Um, Jesus says in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus doesn't say to his disciples, by the way that you play guitar, or by the way that you pray, or by the size of your church, or by the splendour of your stained glass windows, um, people will know you are my disciples. He says, by, love, by the way you love one another, people will know. Um, over Easter, I was listening to um, Spring Harvest Home, and um, I, there's, a, there's a, a preach on there by Gavin, I forget his name, head of the EA, um, and he has a fantastic message about reaching people and about uh, his message speaks about how how we show love um, and the gospel, particularly in these difficult times. And he basically he says we should do it with words, with works and with wonders. So watch it as like a part two on loving your neighbour. So I started with that article about um, the church, at least in the West, being predicted to be dead in 20 years time now. Are we half dead? No, we are not. We are far from it. How do we know this? Because the church will continue to prevail and it will continue to do so because Jesus says so. And because when we follow his commands to love God and to love one another, we are being Jesus on earth. Churches are seen um, as places which benefit the community they're in, from food banks, homeless shelters, youth clubs, etc. And now more than ever, our message of hope has power in bringing life and freedom to people who are in death or fear. So that's it, we've finished, and um, we're going to go back into a time of worship. And one of the songs which we're singing today, we might have already sung it, and we might be about to sing it, is 
Um, it says strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. So if you need strength, if you need to know how to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, if you need to know how to love your neighbour, um, then let that be your anthem this week in everything you do. Thanks. I hope you have a good week. God bless.